Hi, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Petrino, and I teach at Fairfield University in Connecticut. As president of EDIS and on behalf of the board, I'm really pleased to welcome you to our EDIS panels for the ALA conference. Renee Berglund and Li Shin Shu, who serve on our board, have organized these really extraordinary papers. Like our international society, these speakers represent the variety and depth of the scholarship being done in Dickinson studies today. And I'd like to share my screen to tell you more. The first panel, Dickinson and Greenness, explores Dickinson's work by raising our awareness of the ways that her poetry connects with the human and global issues of our day. Ranging from the pedagogical with Barbara Mossberg's insights into Dickinson's experiment in green to the poetic and deeply personal as in Gillian Osborne's discussion in which she examines Dickinson's connection with nature through a network of contemporary poets who share her deep kinship with the non-human world. These papers place Dickinson in relation to many issues, texts and contexts, local and global, human and non-human, individual and community, science and religion. Surprising us into an awareness of their complexity, Karen Anderson's paper on fungi traces how the scale shifting and rapid growth of mushrooms allow Dickinson to reframe human subjectivity in terms of non-human life. In similar ways, Renee Berglund raises our awareness of Dickinson's work at the intersection of science and emotion through her perceptive and informative readings. In her investigation of the eco-Gothic, Li Shin Shu describes an unsettling fear associated with nature to create an alternate ecological and non-human centered view of the world. Taken together, these papers, which benefited from sustained dialogue among the authors, also suggest how our joining readings and conversation through digital modes of communication allow us to see connections in new interrelated ways. The second panel, Dickinson in Her and Our Time, situates Dickinson in the context of the national and the global philosophy, landscape, religion, music, and the arts. These papers suggest both her affiliation with the writers and artists of her era and her continuing importance to our historical moment. As Mishumi Banerjee describes, the Kantian resonances of Dickinson's poetry demonstrate her deep philosophical orientation. Religion and music in the papers of Amy Crawford and Gerard Holmes provide a means to investigate the ways Dickinson as a Calvinist Christian and a well-trained musician used doctrinal or musical form to signal her departure from traditional thinking and poetic form. Drawing inspiration about Dickinson from recent Twitter accounts, Micah Bateman explores the way her use of hope exemplifies her understanding that in her time, as in our own, her poem might have been used to convey a naive sense of optimism and comfort she herself questioned. And Krista Holm Vogelius reads Dickinson against the Hudson River School artists, placing her within a framework of nationalist discourse that extolled America, while at the same time emphasizing her global and planetary, to borrow a phrase from Renee Berglund, outlook. I hope you will enjoy these recordings as much as I did. If you do, I encourage you to join as a member of EDIS. As a result of the pandemic, EDIS held in 2020 its first successful online conference, Dickinson at a Distance, and we plan to offer another virtual annual meeting this August on Dickinson and Shakespeare. Besides our annual meeting, we have plans for an exciting 2022 EDIS International Conference in Seville on the topic of Dickinson and foreignhood. We now also have a YouTube channel where we have recordings of a new virtual series of talks we began this spring, hashtag Dickinson Live. For more information, or if you wish to share and present your research, feel free to consult our website or send an email to me. Please don't hesitate to contact us if you have questions, comments, or suggestions. And with that, enjoy. Hi, 
I'm Xu Li Xin, organizer of the Emily Dickinson International Society panel at ALA, along with Elizabeth Petrino and Renee Berglund. I'm from National Zhengzhou University, Taiwan. It is with great delight for me to introduce you to our 2021 panel on Emily Dickinson and greenness. Our topics range from grass, fungus, and ghosts to green imagination and ecological activism. Although we decided not to include a Q&A component in our pre-recorded session this time, during the course of preparing for this recording, we formed an email group and workshop exchanging our drafts and ideas with each other. The presentations proved to be surprisingly diverse, stimulating, internet-connected in productive and multi-layered ways, yielding fruitful and illuminating thoughts on Dickinson as a green point. I hope you will find the talks as engaging as I did. All the content information of our scholars is made available online, so please don't hesitate to contact us if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions. Enjoy! This whole experiment of green, teaching Emily Dickinson and the Anthropocene, now more than ever for the class of 2025. Hello, I'm Barbara Mossberg, professor at the Clark Honors College at the University of Oregon. I see us at ground zero in today's generation, where Dickinson, I argue, is more important than ever to translate, to be taught and researched as a green poet in humanities, social sciences, and sciences. This talk presents evidence of Emily Dickinson's greenity through the lens of future environmental leaders using my experiments of green to illuminate her green thumb writer's hand at work in mid 19th century US political and environmental uh, destruction and emergent national conscience. Our next generation of leaders reads her not as an anomaly, but as a broad and urgent relevance, a way forward to a greener new era. This talk provides a framework for such vision by considering two poems as anthems of the anthropocenic conscience. Teachers have their fingers on the pulse of concerns animating today's students. As a professor of practice, I had this opportunity to practice innovative pedagogies in the liberal arts, where students' learning is organized around environmental and social justice, leadership on climate change, and the interrogation of life in the Anthropocene. In this ethos, I developed eco-literature and a green imagination. At a time when Emily Dickinson's place in the curriculum may be questioned in terms of relevance to society's most pressing needs, I frame my course with what I consider her green anthem, A Little Madness in the Spring. I base an eco-critic's workshop on her A Read of Evanescence, and they green sleuth her poetry, locating her radical vision as they see it of both social justice with her identity anthem, I'm nobody, who are you, and environmental justice. In the context of civil war and civil rights issues, we discuss Dickinson's poems of identity trauma and eco-grief, building on Ryan Hedegar's homesickness of trauma and the longing for a place in a changing environment, and the redemptive role of the artist for healing and resilience. We probe Dickinson's eco-poetic mindset, building on her reading and the day's news and the litter and spirit of her own garden and surrounding nature. So, teaching Dickinson then and now towards a new poetics ethnography. A root of evanescence with a revolving wheel, a resonance of emerald, a rush of kokanee and every blossom on the bush adjusts its tumbled head. The male from Tunis, probably, an easy morning ride. Well, long ago and far away, Dickinson's work was edited to conform to an idea of publishable poetry. Her access to her literary achievement was further limited by a prism through which 
scholarship and teaching of her was based on a handful of poems that aligned with an idea of a mysterious 19th century poetess. New criticism further limited our understanding of Dickinson's broad relevance by insisting that the biographical, political, and environmental context in which the poem is created is unimportant and inacademic. Dickinson's poems were taught piecemeal and as anomalies. Then, in the confinement stage in bi biopoetic eras, roughly from 1890 to the early 1970s, I came of age during this time, long span, as a Dickinson scholar, perhaps through ignorance and lack of scholarly experience, wondering about the rest of Dickinson's 2000 poems eclipsed by cleaning up her irregularities and ignoring her um, or writing over poems about the anguish and goals of a woman denied equal rights access and voice in civic culture. The approach to a subcanonic peripheral Dickinson further limited access to a greater and accessible Dickinson through the teaching of her poems as intellectual strangeness. My first experience with her reflected this concept. A root of evanescence was presented as gotcha to high school students invited to opine on its meeting. We all got it wrong. Finally told it was about a hummingbird. We were mystified, not really understanding what evanescence was, or for that matter, kokomo. We didn't see any flying going on. We couldn't recognize a bird in it, and we left that classroom and school disillusioned with ourselves, our teacher, our school, and Dickinson herself. But in the liberation stage, the 1970s through the early 2000s, the impact of the civil rights movement, anti-war movements, and feminist movement created an intersectional way of understanding Emily Dickinson's voice. Her poetry was liberated from its edited cages. We could access her manuscripts. New scholarship revealed the impact of her environment, including the patriarchal culture and politics of her day. Her poetry was liberating to a new generation of readers, seeing in its challenge to traditional grammar and poetics and conventional thinking. Thinking a rebellion akin to the political and social rebellions of our times. Her poetry could be seen as feminist, anti-war, and attuned to civil and human rights. This period could be seen as liberation, but how did we teach her now? We taught her in context. She was understood in relation to her community and women writers and fields beyond linguistics, cultural history, religion, war, psychology, and women's and gender studies. She was important in the curriculum, canonical in her own right. Her scholarship flourished nourished by continuous new access to manuscripts and primary source material. We saw a whole Dickinson and her complex humanity, but at the same time, new academic currents were developing. The environmental movement was energizing emergent fields, including environmental humanities, the study of literature about the environment, coalescing with widespread public unrest, not only about civil rights, but about the environment and increasingly climate change. Dickinson was known for charming nature poems, geographically and scientifically accurate. But was Emily Dickinson relevant in these days of environmental crisis and a new generation building environmental humanities? Or was she to be relegated once again to a historical genius meme, respected for her complicated interrogation of language and poetry itself, but not generative in the discussion of how poetry matters in a threatened and threatening world. I ponder on that. Fast forward to today. There's a pandemic and greater awareness and critique of human impact on the environment. Within the climate change consciousness, issues of indigenous heritage, civil and human rights, conflict over land management and resources, Black Lives Matter, immigration, other and foreign walls to keep people out, to confine people. Question, the academy and its gates are redefined. Not only the curriculum changes, the classroom itself, things have changed. Students bring iPhones and computers and tablets to class. Scholarship is posted online. During the pandemic, students' classroom is their own room with a computer 
animated by Wi-Fi, then such what? Who is Emily Dickinson now? It turns out she owns this world. She not only can be read and seen, but provides trenchant leadership and critical vision. So if we look at the root of Evanescence, the pedagogical plant, I began eco-literature with this poem to recreate my high school English trauma and to build from my own fraught path to literary scholarship. I asked students to write on the poem as our opening activity. I expect them to experience the poem as difficult, elusive, intimidating, to write convinced and convincingly about it, but not to know it features a hummingbird. Thus, I can pronounce their analysis wrong, 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 just kidding, using my own discouraged experience to reframe poetry as a new wrong, new, no wrong zone. Experiencing a poem, we can base our interpretive response on evidence from the poem, including what we bring to it from our own knowledge and outside resources. So I ask them to go around the room sharing their interpretation. Then I'm going to marvel at the significance of how identical lines invoke different readings and supportive evidence, a miracle of poetry. Each person's reading and experience brought to and lit by the poem serves as introductions and a way to experience our diversity as a learning community. My clever pedagogy was immediately shut down and its naivete apparent when we went around the room to hear students take on the poem. A few said eloquent things about nature cycles, sunrise, morning walks. Most said, it's about a hummingbird. I tried to be delighted, even as my pedagogical plan took a root of evanescence. And I asked their evidence for this. They discussed evanescence and the clue of coconut. How? This generation, confronted with an unknown, logically consults their iPhones and laptops for immediate on-site assistance, dictionaries, and even critical commentary and context. It's a whole new world for literary criticism. Yet I realized that they were doing the same thing Dickinson was doing as she composed her poems with her dictionary on her lap and thesaurus and atlas position nearby. We were reading with instantaneous access to scholarship, transforming the classroom into a library and literary conference. Pivot. We can incorporate into class activities students' retrieval of digital manuscripts and poems' cultural history. The internet was an immediate resource. Researching hummingbirds, students marveled how the poem expresses and recreates biological facts, such as how in this context, evanescence is a brilliant word choice for the actual flight behavior of the bird. The poem was discussed as an illustration of ornithology, a biological ekphrasis, and flash political ecology, and attitudes towards gl global biodiversity, including a critique of the offhand casual attitude which takes for granted the amazing span of hummingbirds over Earth and of insouciance about our own technological abilities to send and receive information globally. The mail from Tunis, probably. Technological access to resources enabled an eco-reading of this poem and Dickinson's literary achievement. This gave me the idea to have students make a taxonomy of Dickinson's earthly creatures, of which the hummingbird is a fractal, examining the poetics and representing environmental knowledge, conscience, and critique, letters to the world of what is at stake and how we treat Earth. We then branch out to other writers to see the roots of Dickinson's learning, and the way she learned from and influenced writers on the same topic. Then we can learn from Dickinson, and I say that in her econess is evidence that her case goes all the way to the Supreme Court. A little madness in the spring is wholesome even for the king, but God be with the clan who ponders this tremendously, this whole experience experiment in green, as if it were his own. Who owns the land? What does it mean to own it? What is ownership? A little madness in the spring is a way in my students' minds to understand contemporary natural resources issues, revealing Dickinson not only as an eco-writer, but an eco-warrior. In six lines, 
Dickinson posits economic and political dynamics of land use. She uses her poem structure to litigate the case. So it's the king, practical, lawful landowner. The immediate interjection, but disrupts her complacency about such power and introduces conflict. There is the clan pondering the land as if it were his own. Dickinson's structure resets and challenges the king's authority. She shows an alternative possibility of vision and experience of the land of the little monogamy. The clown's enthusiastic engagement, tremendous. The clan, king little, clown, tremendous conflict is litigated in a higher court. However wholesome kingly tepidness, the actual land's owner, God, sides with the clan, undermining the human legal owner. Anthropocenic reasoning. A humble enthusiast will not take earth's unending spring for granted. Our class discussions of this poem drew from law, political science, economics, history, environmental studies, biology, philosophy, ethnic and regional studies, and literature in pondering the implications of feeling something is ours. Students saw this poem providing framework for our times and headlines indeed. In a way, 19th century people without legal rights interpreted these source conflicts in political power. The issues of the national parks carved out of indigenous people's lands and private lands appropriated by the U.S. government are here in this poem. Does the king deserve, much less have the right, to own the land? Is this poem king talk, though? What about Dickinson's use of this tremendous scene, its tremendous reality, a priori knowledge of the writer of the poem? Is the clown not only one with God, but with the poet? Why the word clown? What is the role of the artist in society? How do art serve policy, understanding, and decisions? How are our people wise in treatment of land and each other? For today's students studying equal literature, the fate of the environment is not just relevant, it is the purpose of the study itself. Equal literature is a point of access for public attitudes and wisdom about the conception and use of resources. Facing realities of habitat loss, change, and uncertainty, students experience eco-literature as terrain to understand eco-grief and trauma. They own it. Shelley's 1821, in defense of poetry, and Ralph Waldo Emerson's 1844, The Poet, become really relevant as a playbook for the role of arts in Dickinson's own mind. The poet she describes in her work, the scene is instrumental to saving the world. Eco-literature not only expresses the public mind, it shapes consciousness and conscience and perhaps consensus, leading to environmental justice. In this context, Dickinson looms large in the Anthropocene curriculum. Pedagogical experiments in green and evolving taxonomy for how we know and teach Dickinson are informed and also changed by the moves and needs of the class of 2025 as they develop evidence and literature for the case on behalf of Earth, continuing its experiment in time. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Jillian Osborne. I'm Joining the panel from Santa Barbara, California, where I live, um, I teach remotely for the Harvard Extension School and Arizona State University, and I'm a curriculum specialist for the Poetry in America project, which is overseen by Elisa New. Um, and today, I've changed my my presentation slightly. I'm just going to focus on um, the in the vicinity of section and read and share a presentation with slides for you. And then one of the things I'd wanted to do with this presentation was connect from past work on Dickinson and greenness and some of the more performative qualities of Dickinson's work and the way she incorporates landscape and context and environment into her work to think more explicitly about some contemporary poets um, whose work I'm engaging with more directly these days. I'm just going to gesture towards some of them at the end. I haven't really had time for this to fully develop, but just to, to show you that there is a connection. So I'm going to share my screen and then share a presentation with you. And then I'm just going to read um, from this. So. These are selections from the chapter 
of my book, Green, 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 um, in the essay called Of the Vicinity Of. Of the Vicinity Of. Of Introductions. When Emily Dickinson met Thomas Wentworth Higginson, she handed him daylilies as an introduction. To another letter, to another minister, Dickinson would write, a blossom is perhaps an introduction to whom none can infer. Of flowers. In the likely winter of 1877, Dickinson to Higginson, when flowers annually died and I was a child, I used to read Dr. Hitchcock's book on the flowers of North America. In the spring before she was born, the junior class at Amherst, who had been attending Edward Hitchcock's lectures on botany, paid for the publication of their professor's catalog of plants growing within the cultivation, sorry, growing without cultivation in the vicinity of Amherst College. Many of these were flowers, though not all. Of Amherst. Of the local poem in a global age, Jahan Ramazani writes, the local is the microcosmic obverse of the global on which it obliquely depends. He continues, in poetry, which often has an especially long memory, any particular place may be mediated through a tissue of radial connections to poems of other times and places. Of Amherst, for example, C. Dickinson, who writes Eden, over a red, red rose, volunteering in a garden at the Emily Dickinson Museum, a facsimile of a fantasy of the original, we read a poem to help the roots catch firmly into dirt. This was late spring 2018, and the cultivation of roses began in China 5,000 years ago or so. Of vicinities. Oops. Sorry, <laughs> of vicinities. In 1829, Hitchcock introduced his catalog of plants growing without cultivation in the vicinity of Amherst as surveying an area of roughly 40 or 50 miles, which is roughly the size of San Francisco, where I met my husband, or of Paris, or by some accounts of the abandoned land in Detroit, where there, were, there are fields of flowers growing without cultivation in the vicinity of city blocks. Driving from California to Massachusetts, we were tourists there. I was pregnant, which was another kind of tourism. Catalogs of plants growing in the vicinity of somewhere were a feature of the intellectual life of the 19th century, of Baltimore, Cincinnati, Columbus, Ottawa, Milwaukee, St. Louis, Salem. Documentation of the vegetation around the vicinity of this other Massachusetts town made up the concluding anonymous essay of Elizabeth Peabody's only edition of aesthetic papers. Peabody was a teacher and a publisher and believed in the innate intelligence of children, their way of uncovering what it is they need to know. Her essay for the edition was called Language. The town where I grew up at the end of another century, where I knew the names of at least some of the plants, not even one mile squared. A matter of solitary acres where we'd walk through the fields pulling Queen Anne's lace in the summer, defleecing milkweed in the fall. Mexico City, where we honeymooned 500 miles squared. London, where we might have lived, had we not already been married, 600. Shiga Prefecture, Japan, where I taught teenagers that reminded me of the ones I'd grown up with, stranded economically within the provincial, 1,550. These are approximations. The Mediterranean, 965,000, the square footage of blue. Of marriage. In the spring of 1821, Ora White married Edward Hitchcock in Amherst, Massachusetts. Nearly a decade earlier, on the other side of the Connecticut River, they'd been teachers together. They acted side by side together in a play, Emancipation of Europe or the Downfall of Bonaparte. Edward was the playwright, Ora the Empress of France. In 1815, the year before what came to be known in some parts of the Northwest Hemisphere as the year without a summer, they'd begun work on an almanac. In the edition published in 1818, Edward attempted to explain the peculiar alterations in the climate of the summer that had never arrived more than a year before. In Europe, 1816 was the summer Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. The sun refused to shine. In Indonesia, a volcano had erupted. Edward thought it might have something to do with spots on the sun. Ora drew them, gaping black holes. Now Edward was a minister and Ora was a wife. Shortly after their marriage, in a letter to the scientist Benjamin Silliman, editor of the American Journal of Science and professor of chemistry, Edward calls his wife my Mrs. Colleague. 
Edward couldn't read the scientific journals in German sent by Silliman, but Ora could translate others if they were written in French. A year later, acknowledging the receipt of Edward's geological study of the Connecticut River, Ora's accompanying unauthorized map. Oh dear, <laughs> that was supposed to be another map that Ora had drawn of the river. Fix that. Here's another one from her classroom drawings. Um, Solomon intuits Edward's coadjutor. He calls the hand of his collaborator more delicate than yours or mine. Of mushrooms. I decide. I should have said that I decided to partly do this other version of the presentation with pictures because of Karen's work on mushrooms, and just so you could see these images of or from Ora White's drawing. So, of mushrooms. Okay, of mushrooms. After marriage, but before Amherst, the Hitchcocks move to Conway. There, Edward gathers mushrooms not for Aura, though she paints them, but for science. In a small volume, one viewer would call the Honeymoon Album. The Hitchcocks' mushrooms are intimate, quaint, the kind of thing you'd want to own in facsimile if it wasn't already out of print. Together, they sent the mushrooms, picked and painted, once living or never alive, to John Torrey, a chemist and botanist who had recently helped form the New York Lyceum of Natural History and an even more recently published catalog of plants growing spontaneously within 30 miles of the city of New York. When they sent him mushrooms, living and dead, Torrey gave the mushrooms uh, numbers, proper names. Emily Dickinson, 50 years later, from the other side of a civil war, the mushroom is the elf of plants. Of star. Emily Dickinson studied science, but she was also skeptical of its reach. She read Hitchcock in the winter and used Elmira Lincoln Phelps familiar lectures on botany at school. Her family owned books on anatomy and chemistry. She writes poems about explosions, volcanic and otherwise. She assembled a not especially scientific herbarium around the same time she sat for a self-portrait. That portrait is gray, the flowers still, some of them, yellow or pink. The fact that Dickinson was touched by a popular interest in science that permeated her age has attracted so much attention, though because in our age, a lot of different kinds of knowledge, and especially forms of knowledge more lucrative than the literary, have ended up clumped together within the scientific. Science is not a sufficient justification now or then for the making of, and especially not the study of, such non-utilitarian things as poems. As much as Dickinson was a very bad Christian and her poetry is unimaginable without the constraints of Christianity, so did she put little faith in science, though her poetry is a species of scientific method lurching against the confines of the known. Arcturus is his other name. I'd rather call him Star. It's very mean of science to go and interfere. Dickinson was caught up in science and sentimentalism the way we are caught in global capital, the way the internet lays piping in the brain. Physics has both a utilitarian and a non-utilitarian face. Nuclear weapons and dark matter. Homes are too embroiled within vicinity to track an either or. Of scale. Ora illustrated nearly all of her husband's scientific works, from large-scale classroom drawings of what Hitchcock thought were fossilized footprints of birds, extinct mastodons, and the volcanic surface of the earth, to reproducible lithographs of shells and striated rock for textbooks. His lecture on winter, which we have seen she did not illustrate, describes in minute detail the effects of a singular meteorological event a messy snow and rainstorm, which, though slight, through slight gradations of temperature, precipitation shifting from snow to rain to ice, transformed the world, that is, the vicinity of Amherst, for a full week and a half into a magnificent temple, a fairyland of glittering forms, trees, and grass, rigid and icy rigor, casting prismatic colors, splendid sapphire blue, amethystine purple, intense topaz yellow, sea green barrel rich emerald green, precious jewels and adjectives. Hitchcock's winter scene ends in a deep hyacinth thread, some glint of the bloody living reasserting itself amid all this lifeless splendor. Edward reckoned it among the unique revelations of nature. Hyperboles like these can only be achieved when the scope of a viewer's experience has been relatively local in scale. The natural bridge of Rockbridge County, wrote Thomas Jefferson in his notes on the state of Virginia, the most sublime of nature's works. 
Jefferson may have been to Paris, but he knew nothing of the Himalayas, not to mention the Grand Canyon. Hitchcock hedges. To those who have not witnessed this particular storm, I may seem enthusiastic and extravagant in my estimates. Prior to this storm, he also would have had trouble believing his own descriptions, but the storm changes everything. The local goes celestial. Of New York. If you grew up in New York outside of New York City, you can't tell people you're from New York the way other people are from Massachusetts or California or Michigan. They assume you mean something other, so you need to qualify upstate or from the state of. I'm from a place that likely no one reading this will recognize or remember. Growing up there, I always had the feeling that swaths of the state had been left behind in time, still playing the same pop songs 30 years later and all that farmland, all that whiteness, all those grain barns. Though the state of also has its own neglected beauties, there are hills there too that might be allegories and a river, an orchard, a cemetery, and a village of vinyl-sided homes. I wouldn't call it Eden, but it resembles so many other places where no one leaves and no one goes. I'm nobody, who are you? Are you nobody too? Of all the poems of Dickinson's I've taught, this one never fails to produce a surprisingly personal response. Of California. My husband came with me to Massachusetts from California for a temporary job at a university there. Now we're moving back to California so that he can continue the old job he left off adver advising others on the use of their land. Forest fires, mudslides, and gazebos in neighbors' yards. Before we left, there was an oil spill up the coast. Climate change feels more present in the West. I won't water the flowers I fell over myself this spring and summer admiring in other people's yards. In fact, I won't grow them there at all. The lilac is an ancient shrub, but so much in California is dry or forgotten except for the hills and the allegories in the sea. And anyway, a California lilac is a ceanothus. I'm not sure how I feel about moving back, moving anywhere, moving at all. I'd like to commit to vicinity wherever and whatever it is. In an interview, the poet Robert Haas says that he felt it was important to put the names of California things, animals, plants, into his poems because other poets weren't, pretending New England was England with its neat seasons and its winter that isn't really winter at all. Gertrude Stein and Robert Frost lived in Oakland when they were young, but you would never know it by her repetitions or his birches. It isn't that I don't like California, it's just that after nearly a decade, I still don't know the names of things growing along roadsides there, apart from the obvious. Yucca shout, shooting upward into a white effusion I thought had a name in Spanish having to do with wedding dresses, but when I looked it up just now in the introduction to California's spring wildflowers, which was a wedding present, I see that its common name is the Lord's candle, the things we do for love. And anyway, the poet Linda Gregg once told the poet Robert Haas, I read about this in the poet Harriet Mullen's introduction to the Book of Tonka, she wrote, while walking through the vicinities of Los Angeles, a city that is nothing if not vicinities of, that's not how anyone sees the world. We see the common pink, purple, fringy splendor over yonder, rather than the sticky monkey flower, Mimulus, I planted this year in my garden. Of, of. Prepositions have no feeling. There is no feeling of of the way William James thought conjunctions had feelings, and if but by as palpable as cold or blue. The feeling of conjunctions comes from their embodiment, ligaments of prose connecting cause and effect, shoring up causes, binding after to before. So Dickinson's Lily completes her education around a conjunctive afterwards linking stanza to stanza, precipitating a move from mold life to the ecstatic barrel bell, green or pink, of lilies of the valley. In its emptiness and association of, it, of is absorbent rather than con connective, yet a, prop a preposition can distinguish between conditions of belonging as subtle and stark as belonging to a place but not being of it. The way Puritans define their place on earth, the way my Quaker father wants to find prayer for me as a teenager, which is all that Quakers do, absenting while being with and in, off with that nothingness while trees rustle and seasons are unconciliatory. To be aligned by preposition rather than conjunction is to be bound by supposition rather than injunction, to be possibly in the vicinity of rather than required to proceed. For instance, I've long loved the way of and for follow each other through Dickinson's house of possibility. 
more numerous of windows, superior for doors, of chambers as the cedars, impregnable of eye, and for an everlasting roof, the gambrels of the sky, of visitors the fairest, for occupation this, this, this. I will not lead you through closer and closer reading. I don't believe that closeness translates well to prose. Notice nonetheless the opening and closing of doors and windows in directions of belonging of or for how they render the edges of place on earth with its Italianate stanzas diaphanous, how permeable it becomes not only to actions of attention, but also to what is living and dying outside of the cedars and of the sky. So that's the end of my reading. And so I just wanted to gesture from there. One, I just wanted to give you a sense of the ways in which that project, um, the Green, Green, Green project that this work is drawing from is a kind of performative essay project of its own. And it's constellating uh, reading practices, archival research, conversations with friends, uh, experience in the landscape and in my garden, memory. and trying to make by demonstration a kind of argument about the living, the life of literature within lives. Um, so I'm using my own experience as a kind of foil or example, but the, the implicit argument of the book, which is never fully uh, foregrounded in that kind of a meta terms um, is, you know, that literature is, takes place and happens to us and that being responsive to that kind of the the context that texts exist in um, changes what we bring to our study of literature and the kinds of conversations that we have about it um, makes space for personal responsiveness and um, forms of affiliation and care among individual readers and between readers and writers. Um, so that's that's that project. And um, oops, sorry. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say, so some of the contemporary poets that I'm thinking about um, in relationship to some of these ideas are Carolyn Bergvall, Jen Bourbon, Tracy Morris, Erin Murray, Cecilia Vicuña, and Emma Rissa Phillip. And these are all writers that really challenge, as Dickinson does, I think, always, the distinction between text and context, between uh, words as static and words as performed or alive, as she asks Higginson to read her poems when she first writes to him. Um, they're all writers who use either manipulate the space of the page to gesture outside of it, like M. Norvisa Phillips does in her amazing Erasure Poem song, where she removes portions of a legal document um, covering this horrific case about um, 18th century case that was instrumental in the anti-slavery movement um, that involved slavers throwing human beings human cargo overboard because they thought they would get more they they were expecting to get more money on the insurance um then then they would have obtained from selling those humans um so that poem is an erasure and leaves all of this empty space and absorbs context vicinity into it and one of the things that interests me about that and about many of these writers who are engaging different historical contexts also um, is that that space is both of the present and the past. So just to give another example, Carolyn Bergvall works a lot with medieval documents um, or writes contemporary poems in Middle English and she's kind of suturing the past and the present through that work or Cecilia Vicuña um, works across English, Spanish and other indigenous languages of South America like Kipu and um, is in that way, again, drawing vicinity into the space of the text, context into the space of the text. So that's it for my presentation. If you would like to be in touch, and I hope that you do, um, please reach out. My email is just my name, Jillian period Osborne at gmail.com, or you can find, um, that information, contact information on my website, which is jillianosborne.net. 
um, or at the Harvard Extension School or at ASU. And thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in this conversation with you all and for your own words and readings. All right, be well, everyone. Bye. I'll start by thanking Chu Yixing and the Emily Dickinson International Society for organizing this panel. I'd also like to thank my fellow presenters, Barbara Mossberg, Yu Xing, Jillian Osborne, and Renee Berglund for their thoughtful contributions and questions. My name is Karen Leona Anderson, and I'm an associate professor at St. Mary's College of Maryland. I'm also the author of two collections of poetry, Punish Honey and Receipt, which is from Milkweed Press. The title of my paper is Dickinson and Fungal Kinship. The story of fungi in human culture can also be read as a story of quicksilver scale shifting, ever frustrating our attempts to divide the world neatly into micro and macro, visible and invisible, individual and collective. Even at the level of taxonomy, fungi have posed difficult problems, neither plant nor animal. They nevertheless share characteristics of both remaining sessile like plants, but like animals operating as digesters rather than producers of their own food. Early European taxonomic work on mushrooms hinged on edibility and toxicity, but later 17th century scientific attention to micromatter in work by Pierre Antonio Micheli and earliest micro early microscopist um, Robert Hooke led to the identification of spores and microscopic fungal structures called hyphae and established a crucial link between these minute parts and macroscopic mushrooms. Linnaeus classified the fungi in the genus Chaos under the worms, and Hooke described them as a kind of sponge, an interesting choice in light of recent genetic work that shows that fungi are closer to animals than plants. Historically, fungi's changeability in size and form has been understood in the Anglo-American cultural context, context as fascinating, bewildering, frightening, and grotesque. Fungi has been, have been seen as alien organisms defying categorization, as toxic weed, weeds or pests, um, as poisonous foods or risky medicines, as signs of mysterious ruin and decay, and as vestiges of uncontrollable magic, otherworldliness, or spiritual essence. In our own moment, however, fungi have become the source of environmental, cultural, and sometimes political hope. Mainstream accounts of fungal potential, such, such as science writer Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind uh, from 2018, and Merlin Sheldrake's An Entangled Life, How Fungi Make Our Worlds, Change Our Minds, and Shape Our Futures from 2020, represent fungi as inventive, flexible, and collaborative organisms that are veteran survivors of ecological catastrophe, in Sheldrake's words. They also document public interest in what Sheldrake calls DIY mycology, which encompasses everything from Paul Stamets' idea of environmental mycoremediation, where mushrooms are used to solve environmental problems, to Peter McCoy's radical mycology, which relies on fungi as both material and social model that might move humans, quote, from domination toward allyship with the fungal queendom, unquote. On a sometimes intertwining track, cultural theory has also arrived in a largely admiring take on fungi. Though Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guitari's rhizomes ground this positive reassessment, as Patricia de Vries has pointed out, it's Anna Singh who, building on Donna Haraway's idea of non-human companion species, explicitly links species interdependence with fungal forms in her anthropological and philosophical account of Matsutake foraging, the mushroom at the end of the world, on the possibility of life in capitalist ruins. Singh's project is explicitly attuned to the questions of environmental justice and material precariousness. She explores the quote, overgrown verges of our blasted landscapes, the edges of capitalist disciplines, scalability, and abandoned resource plantations through mushrooms because as she says, quote, no one fungal body lives self-contained, removed, from indeterminate encounters. Further, Singh uses those indeterminate, interdependent, and often invisible fungal morphologies to model more contingent ways of thinking in which we might, quote, speculate about open-ended questions in a spore-like way. In this presentation, I hope to suggest that Emily Dickinson's vision of the mushroom presages our current cultural interest in it. 
In a reimagination of fungi as wily antagonists to cultural and biological control, Dickinson, I argue, reframes human subjectivity in object-oriented terms, invested with the same potential for those strange and powerful bonds of kinship central to much of the environmental theory of recent decades. This largely positive view of fungi is at odds with most literary mentions of fungi in the 19th century. British and American writers from this period were generally mycophobic, which is a term developed by ethnomycologists R. Gordon Wasson and Valentina um, Guerkin to describe a hatred or fear of fungi. They've also tended to be somewhat microphobic in canonical literature. As cultural critic R.T. Ralph notes, Charles Dickens, Alfred Lord Tennyson, and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow all use fungi as a kind of figurative shorthand for degenerative conditions arising from an invisible cause. Charles Chestnut, for example, describes fungi as, quote, gross, social, as well as vegetable, which flourish best in the dark. Fungi were also suspected as the cause of human disease and destruction. As sorry, Altshuler notes in her book, The Medical Imagination, Edgar Allan Poe's story, The Fall of the House of Usher from 1839, provides a particularly clear and striking example of this type of micro-mycophobia. Altshuler theorizes the co-evolution of Poe's story with a medical hypothesis. His physician poet friend, John Kersley Mitchell, proposed that cholera was caused by fungal spores. As Altshuler shows, Poe's fungal imagery intensified as he revised the story and he highlighted um, more fully the minute fungi that overspread the whole exterior of the doomed house. And in this, he was influenced, she argues, by Mitchell's gothic xenophobic account of fungi. For Mitchell, the fungal spore was a quote, foreign intruder welcomed by a domestic facilitation and entering upon a career of desolation end quote there. And he saw humans as particularly vulnerable to fung fungal spores. Quote, they are so like to animal cells, he says, as to have the power of penetrating into and germinate germinating upon the most interior tissues of the human body. So one important element of this 19th century mycophobia was the speed at which microfungi could take over and become macrofungi. Fungi's ability to produce mushrooms depends on a form of growth that's really different than um, human cell division, that form of um, growing where we produce more cells. Um, the fruiting of a mushroom depends on existing cells in the hyphae or mycelia of the mushroom, of the, of, the, of the fungus rather, filling with water over a matter of hours during fruiting, sometimes with enough force to break in the pavement, thus uh, the verb to mushroom, right, which is to kind of like explode um, with growth in a short period of time. In the 19th century, this scale shifting was regarded as a particularly inexplicable feature of fungal growth. Emily Dickinson's late poem, The Mushroom is the Elk of Plants from 1874, offers a rare and interesting example of admiring ambivalence toward this rapid shift. As such, it's an interesting precursor um, to tw of 20th century shifts in attitude toward fungi. Dickinson's poem locates fungal rebellion against human ideas about nature in the incredible speed of fungal growth from invisible micromatter to undeniable macromatter. And I'll read the poem because it's short. The mushroom is the elf of plants. At evening, it is not. At morning, in a truffled hut, it stop upon a spot as if it tarried always. And yet its whole career is shorter than a snake's delay and fleeter than a tear. Tis vegetation's juggler, the germ of alibi, doth like a bubble antedate and like a bubble high. I feel as if the grass was pleased to have it intermit the surreptitious scion of summer's circumspect. Had nature any supple face, or could she one contemn? Had nature an apostate, that mushroom, it is him. So from its truffled huts to its apostates, jugglers to germs, happy grass to disapproving mothers, the mushroom in Dickinson's poem evokes both whimsical delight and a faint whiff of menace. 
The quick shifts in metaphorical vehicle for the mushroom from elf to juggler to germ to cyan to heretic seem to echo or perhaps even parody the multitude of fungal forms. This appears also to be what makes fungi an apostasy within the natural world, that they grow unnaturally fast, bringing from apparent nothingness to truffled hut overnight. They trouble the slow, deliberate order of organismal cell division in apparent renunciation of nature's laws. Literally and figuratively sporadic, the mushroom appears and disappears in ways that are at odds with the limits of human perception and human expectation. But the pump's comparisons also point out that this uncannily invisible growth means fungi are always present, even if they are not perceived by humans. While the vehicle of each metaphor shifts and twists and turns the tenor, the mushroom itself remains stable and insistent. The fungi does not take a single scalable shape, but it stays at least partially itself, thus resisting human expectations that the non-human world will behave in an ordered determinant or visible way. Dickinson's persistently present rebellious mushroom seems to offer an alternative social order too, replacing hierarchy with kinship, as several other critics have noticed. The elf and solo juggler of the first few stanzas give way to a scene of strange and contingent interconnection and interrelation in the final two stanzas. Not only is the grass um, remarkably companionable, it seems pleased to be suspended by the summer as a sign, uh, mushroom by the sign as a sign of summer, but Upon looking around, the speaker determines that the mushroom is a scion or son of summer circumspect. The secret child of a season growing in every direction and at every scale, the mushroom is linked by underground kinship to these non-human invisible forces of warmth and humidity that catalyze it. The multi-species collaborations for which fungi are known scientifically from lichen to digestion to breaking down other dead organisms or even um, more recent uh, developments um, in understanding fungi through the wood wide web where uh, mushrooms connect trees seem to resonate with a fungus whose smallness here as Angela Sorby puts it, invites the formation of interdependent interspecies bonds as well as associations with the large scale forces of the season. As Christopher Benfee and Jillian Osborne have both pointed out, this form of knowing is essentially relation, relational. And um, this form of knowing is also predicated on a resistance to fully and objectively knowing anyone or anything. These are not necessarily always harmonious relationships. The tensions within the final stanza gesture to that but they are instances of interdependency and interrelation. Highlighting micromatter scalar instability also upends the sense that the non-human world is visible, slow, and beneficent to humans, a kind and predictable setting for human progress. Here, quicksilver scale shifting from invisible hyphae to a fruiting body characterizes what Singh calls, calls the unruly edges and an apostatical resistance to the maternal and legislative functions attached to 19th century sentimental figures of mother nature. It seems in fact that nature, unlike summer or the grass, is the only non-human figure in the poem to potentially object to the mushroom's irregular antics. But that she does not subtly distinguishes her from some of the stereotypes of mother nature during this period. Dickinson's nature is not exactly that smiling, infinitely patient, fond mother that Longfellow imagines gently nudging her children up to bed. Instead, the conditional syntax of the final stanza suggests that while we might expect nature to object, she does not necessarily do so. Despite the mushroom being a figure of magic, trickery, illusion, collusion, shape-shifting, rebellion, and betrayal, nature shows no disgust or annoyance. Instead, unlike humans, she seems to encompass or embrace or at least tolerate such startling sporadicity and difference. The troubling problems of scale shifting, Dickinson points out, are here only problems for humans who insist on obedience to a visible and authoritative order, or who do not believe in the irreducible alterity at the heart of all relationships. If Dickinson founded fungus, an emblem of both multi-species interconnection and social rebellion, much of British and American literature that came after tended to regard fungal scale shifting with, with more skepticism as a byword for uncanny degenerative growth. Scientific accounts into the 20th century continue to suggest that 
fungi had devolved from algae into parasitic plants, and there was ongoing confusion as to whether fungal cells were plant or animal. While canonical modernist literature consistently linked fungus and cultural degeneracy, the interest in surreptitious force um, that, that fungi have in Dickinson's poem presages the shift from a predominantly white male response to fungi to the more diversely authored art and literature of the late 20th and 21st centuries um, of, of fungus, uh, which orients itself around the very disruptions that rendered fungi suspect to earlier writers from Patty Ann Rogers' poem Geocentric, which celebrates uh, the many forms of fungal life in a compost pile, to Alberto Rios's prayer for the dangerous, fungal interests move steadily toward the invisible, the positive, and the spiritual. Indeed, Dickinson's wry take on fungi as an alternate mischievous model for human and non-human interrelation has become in the 21st century a more earnestly pursued idea as Singh's work shows. It's also become more common to understand the human as directly impacted by the networks of non-human life. Microfungi appear in everything from J. Rim's fungal burial suit, a form of conceptual art, to Stella McCartney's fungal leather, um, you know, commodity as a way to ameliorate Western individualism and greed in both material and conceptual forms as a quick growing remedial biotechnology, a conceptual model for mutualistic networks, and as a conversing subject, as in the fungal queendom. In contrast to the dismay, fear, or disgust that fungi's relentless uncanny shape-shifting, Emily Dickinson's ambivalent admiration for the fungal rebel is an echo in contemporary poet and essayist Ross Gay's wholehearted embrace of microscopic fungal networks in his Book of Delights from 2019, and also for him a kind of model for radical black joy. The trees and the mushrooms, he says, have shown me this. Joy is the mostly invisible, the underground union between us, you and me, which is among other things, the great fact of our life and the lives of everyone and thing we love going away. If we sink a spoon into that fact, into the depth between us, we will find it teeming. It will look like all the books ever written. It will look like all the nerves in a body. We might call it sorrow, but we might call it a union, one that once we notice it, once we bring it into the light, might become flower and food might be joy. Those kinships and sometimes uneasy interconnections that Dickinson implies in her poem have become facts for us. For us now, fungi are both invisible and essential, vulnerable and dangerous, at once a sign, an incarnation of our promising and perilous dependency on what we cannot fully know or see. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Renee Berglund. I'm a professor of literature and writing at Simmons University in Boston. I have written books about Native American literature and about women in science. And my current project is called Natural Magic. It's about Charles Darwin and Emily Dickinson and the magic at the heart of 19th century science. Um, this paper is drawn from that book. It's called Emily Dickinson's Sphere of Green. And I'm going to be spending most of my time on PowerPoint. So at this point, I'm going to share the screen with you. Okay. Emily Dickinson once described her world as a sphere of simple green. In this paper, I wanna talk about Dickinson's sphere and about what it means to be green. Let's start with Dickinson's sphere. At home in Amherst, Emily Dickinson was surrounded by scientists and theologians. Edward Hitchcock's religion of geology set the tone for the entire town. In 1855, Hitchcock opened Wood's Cabinet, a new large fossil museum, just a few blocks from the homestead. There, Emily could contemplate the world's largest collection of dinosaur tracks or page through the ingenious stone books that Hitchcock had fashioned by prying apart layers of sedimentary rock so that students could examine changing fossil impressions across the centuries. 
In June 1856, a 10-ton boulder scored with glacial striations was excavated from in front of the Dickinson's house. A crew of enthusiastic geology students rolled the giant stone up the hill and brought it to rest in front of the woods cabinet. This is Edward Hitchcock's drawing of the boulder striations. In Edward Hitchcock's Amherst, a 20,000 pound boulder was not just a rock. It was a telegram from the deep past of the earth. Judging from the composition of the stone, Hitchcock determined that it had once formed part of the ledge of a nearby mountain, Metawampe. Glaciers had carried the boulder 10 miles south and deposited it in the rich soil where humans would eventually come to live. The marks on the surface of the stone told a story of great planetary forces working over thousands of years. Hitchcock's community shared his vivid sense of the tiny, infinitesimal smallness of their own quotidian Amherst lives, measured on the scales of astronomical space and geological time. Glacial erratics and fossil footprints and the rich alluvial soil of Amherst were geological messages from the deep reaches of time. Changes, changing angles of sunlight, the unchanging stars, and occasionally the flaring colors of the great auroras illuminated the vastness of planetary space. Here's a photo of that very boulder on the campus of Amherst today. For Hitchcock, the implications of 19th century science were primarily theological. His 1851 book on the religion of geology summed up what was at stake. For Dickinson, the stakes were different. The intersection of science and religion interested her, but what interested her more was the intersection of science and emotion. When her thoughts turned to geology, she speculated about the feelings of stones. How happy is the little stone? And volcanoes, Vesuvius at home. When she thought about astronomy, she wondered about the ether. If consciousness, thought and emotion was somehow electromagnetic, could it travel across space? When she considered infinity, her thoughts left beyond the God of Christian orthodoxy. Her questions, poetic and scientific, were about consciousness and emotion. Could she find a way to express how infinity felt? This is a close-up of that boulder. In a letter to Elizabeth Holland, Dickinson compressed her questions about the infinite and the infinitesimal into a brief phrase, calling them problems of the dust. Dickinson's mother had fallen ill when they moved to the homestead. On the one hand, Dickinson feared her mother might die. Death was the large, infinitely large problem of the dust. On the other, she was frustrated that housework and care work took so much time away from her writing and thinking. The literal, if infinitesimal dust, drove her to distraction. In her January 1856 letter, she wrote, I often wish I was a grass or a toddling daisy whom all these problems of the dust might not terrify. How does the idea of grass offer solace for the problems, the dust. Let's talk about Dickinson's idea of green. I can find my page. A year after her letter to Holland in 1862, Dickinson would copy a poem about that wish into a carefully stitched booklet. The grass so little starts to do, has to do, starts, the grass so little has to do, a sphere of simple grain with only butterflies to brood and bees to entertain. Subsequent verses outline the life cycle of a grass through day and night and eventual death, concluding, the grass so little has to do, I wish I were a hay. In the context of Dickinson's letter to Holland, this poem may be suggesting that Dickinson would rather be dead than do housework. But in the rest of this paper, I will suggest that 
Dickinson's concept of grass and of a sphere of simple grain was not so simple after all. Death was a part of it, to be sure, but interconnected and continuously evolving life grew green from every grave. Let's turn to Of Bronze and Blaze, another poem from 1862, which gestures back to the problems of the dust and to the grass and the daisies that Dickinson had mentioned in her letter to Elizabeth Holland. Perhaps in Dickinson's mind, it was also connected with the great auroras that had heralded the start of her epic epistolary years and her first publication. This is a 1850s painting of the Aurora Borealis. Of bronze and blaze, the north to night, so adequate it forms, so preconcerted with itself, so distant to alarms, an unconcern so sovereign to universe or me, infects my simple spirit with taints of majesty. Till I take vaster attitudes and strut upon my stem, disdaining men and oxygen for arrogance of them. My splendors are menagerie, but their completeless show will entertain the centuries when I am long ago an island in dishonored grass whom none but daisies know. Of Bronze and Blaze starts by describing the Northern Lights as far, far above earthly concerns. I wanted to have that show, yeah. Okay. Of Bronze and Blaze starts by describing the Northern Lights as far above earthly concerns, distant to alarms. The poet explains that the sovereign transcendence of the aurora infects my simple spirit with taints of majesty. And she boasts of her vaster attitudes as she struts her poetic stuff, disdaining men and oxygen. At the height of her arrogance, the poet boasts, my splendors are menagerie. But then her thoughts turn back to the aurora. She twists her ars longa vita brevis conceit once more to conclude that poetry fades in comparison with the aurora's completeless show. Recalling the vast scale of geological time, she concedes that the Northern Lights will entertain the centuries when I am long ago an island in dishonored grass whom none but daisies now. Though of Bronze and Blaze is very different in tone from the earlier Sick Transit Gloria Mundi, the Valentine's Latin tag, which translates, thus the world's glory passes, applies equally well to the more serious private poem. The swing from grandiloquent boasting to utter humility in of Bronze and Blaze is characteristic of Dickinson's writing. At first, the poet compares herself to the eternal wonders of the universe, claiming the aurora's crown of light. In the next breath, she speaks from her own future grave, buried in earth, linked to the grass, beetles, and daisies. When I am long ago, an island in dishonored grass, to none but daisies. Grass is often connected to impermanence in the Bible. The grass withers, the flower fades. It's from Isaiah. If we read the last lines of the poem as primarily focused on death, the conclusion reinforces the vita brevis, life is short idea. But from another angle, the daisies, the beetles, and the grass all seem surprisingly lively. In her letter to Holland, Dickinson had imagined being a grass or a daisy as being happy and brave, free from fear and responsibility. In the poem, the natural beings share some sort of consciousness. The last word of the poem is an active verb, no. This, reason, this reading emphasizes the idea that nature will continue to know the poet centuries after her death. If art is long, nature is even longer. 
Taken together, the daisies, beetles, and grass evoke the sort of ethically meaningful natural world that had inspired early 19th century naturalists. Laura Dessau Walls has referred to the attitudes of early 19th century naturalists as green world naturalism. In this context, the dishonored grass in Dickinson's final couplet may gesture toward the green world and toward the ecologically hopeful attitudes of early 19th century naturalists that were increasingly disparaged as the century progressed. Beetles and daisies could be particularly significant for this worldview. Charles Darwin's boyhood passion for beetles had marked him as a naturalist, just as Dickinson's love for flowers marked her. In the 1850s, optimistic naturalism was fading fast. In the place of the green world, Tennyson described nature, red in tooth and claw. A handful of American thinkers, most notably Whitman, Thoreau, and Dickinson, held on to the greener vision of naturalism, resisting bleak assumptions that were increasingly seen as scientific. Most of their peers, however, adopted, were adopting Tennyson's red in tooth and claw, understanding of nature as bloody, violent, probably meaningless. In contrast to such pessimistic understandings of the natural world, Dickinson's choice to end of bronze and blaze with all knowing grass and daisies was startlingly optimistic. Dickinson was developing a scientifically informed green vision of nature that offers readers hope of a bridge from the green dawn of the 19th century to our own dreams of a grass green future. Thank you very much. Hi, I am Xu Li Xin, currently working at the National Chenchi University, Taiwan. The presentation comes from a critical plant studies project I'm working on at this moment about eco-gothic in a number of Taiwanese contemporary poets and 19th century Anglo-American writers. I would like to thank my fellow panelists, Karen, Gillian, Barbara, and Renee, for providing the most valuable comments on this draft. The photo on the slide is a picture of a group of ancient Formosa and Cypresses discovered in the deep mountains at Taidong, the eastern part of Taiwan, in 2018. Its serpentine movement, I think, fits into the theme of eco-gothic Dickinson in this presentation. Dickinson is often considered an ecophiliac poet. Her poems about nature, as many critics have shown, reveal her deep proto-ecological consciousness. I listed a number of critics on the slide here for your reference. Her naturalist scientific training at school, her passion for gardening, and her nuanced descriptions of subtle changes in natural phenomena disclose the ecological thinker in the making. What seems less noted, however, is the ecophobic sentiment in her representation of nature and her exploration of the uncanny side of the story, the massively entangled, haphazard, awkward, and more often than not, vexed human-on-human -human interactions. The talk examines some of Dickinson's dark pastoral poems, not to argue for Dickinson's ecophobia, but rather to explore more ecographic dimensions in her literary endeavors. Building upon previous scholarship about Dickinson's ecopoetic humility, the talk looks at how the poem utilizes haunting as an alternative literary strategy to unsettle the epistemological authority of human agency. While exposing the inadequacy of hierarchical human-centric impositions over nature, her eco-gothic poems also disclose the deep-seated anxiety, discomfort, or even fear that seem not readily acknowledged by the romantic transcendentalist contemporary writers of her time. As is shown on the slide, eco-gothic has been linked with a number of eco-critical concepts, such as Lee Rozelle's Eco Sublime, Simon Stock's Ecophobia, Richard Snyder's Dark Nature, Timothy Morton's Dark Ecology, Resin Alex and Susan Deborah's Eco Fear, to name just a few. These discussions about the dark side of human non human interactions provide a fertile ground to explore eco Gothicism in Dickinson. 
the photo of the Indian ghost pipe on the slide, which also appears in her poetry, is evocative in terms of my conceptualization of Dickinson's Gothic gardens here. Dickinson depicts the eco-Gothic sensation explicitly in A Narrow Fellow in the Grass. The photo on the slide shows a common garter snake often seen in Amherst and the Massachusetts area. In the poem, the speaker's vulnerability when a boy and barefoot, while encountering a snake, is deepened by the physical proximity of this unknown creature with the formidable presence of the snake closing at your feet and opening further on. The failure of the speaker to stoop to secure the snake further indicates this loss of human controls over non-human agencies, its instant movement, a whiplash upbraiding the sun, highlights his gothic presence with suggested violence. The swoon further points towards a projected alliance between the snake and the location too hostile for agricultural and thus human cultivation. Dickinson's speaker acknowledges that her passion for nature has its limit in the last two stanzas of the poem, in locations like the boggy acre, a floor too cool for corn. Nature's people can be turned into nature's monsters. Qualities of alienness, disorder, and monstrosity also feature prominently in Dickinson's poems about the storm. In poems, like an awful tempest mashed the air, and there came a wind like a bugle, Dickinson practices what I would call her eco-gothic pageantry, in which the otherness of the non-human world is revealed in an emphatically theatrical mode. In the first poem, an awful tempest is described as a specter and a monster from the sea. In the second poem, a mysterious wind is depicted as an emerald ghost, as well as a bugle, a serpentine figure that quivered through the grass and brought a green chill upon the heat. The photo on this slide is Hurricane Florence that hit Amherst in 2018, an image I think responding to this emerald ghost of Dickinson quite well. Its instant movement is like the Doom's electric magazine, another reptile illusion resounding Dickinson's zero at the bone moment in the previous poem. Actually, in Webster's American Dictionary of the English Language, Maxson can refer to the deerskin shoe of Native Americans who travel swiftly on foot, but it might also evoke a venomous North American snake. Here, the racial order is converged with the reptilian order to account for the ghostly effect created by lightning strikes. These storms of Dickinson, peculiarly, is often accompanied with a sense of hilarity and thus sets the motive of an apocalyptic narrative and the gravity of ecological survivorship to a comic relief. In the first poem, while the awful violence of the tempest that mashed the air might seem terrifyingly ghostly with its black cloak hiding heaven and earth from view, is greeted by the creatures in the poem with carnivalesque jovial joviality. The, the reactions of the non-human creatures switch from the merriment to enrichment within one single stanza, from chuckling on the roofs or whistling in the air to gnashing their teeth and swinging their frenzied hair, resembling an eco-spiritual congregation or trance-like Sion. Although Dickinson's poem eventually returns to a more anthropocentric perspective with the pastoral celebration of peace restored in the end, the poem also momentarily breaks away from the human-centric mode to present a more diverse, multi-species picture, an ecological carnival in action. Similarly, in the second poem, Dickinson shows the painting trees greatly affected by the storm's assault, but unlike the humans who bar the windows and doors and the fences that fled away, they are a strange mob injected with the revolutionary momentum of the bugle sounding wind. Like the uncontrollable rivers that flood the houses, these pending trees are conjured up by the emerald ghost to become unwitting conspirators of the ecological riot. Their strangeness speaks to the contagious possession, agitation, and domination of the supernatural wind and its necromantic power. 
Dickinson's eco-gothic epiphany is further explored in What Mystery Pervades a Well. The well is exoticized as a neighbor from another world, residing a jar with its lid of glass evoking an eastern genie from the Arabian Nights, whose limit none have ever seen. Dickinson complicates the tension between the speaker and the unknown neighbor by partially considering the perspective it's of its neighboring grass that does not appear afraid, and thus inviting a temporary speculative perspective in the third stanza. I often wonder. The well grass sees such analogy highlights the multispecies presence in nature. The vegetal speculation, while originated from a human-centric viewpoint, also points to the possibility of an alternative form of human-non-human -human understanding. Or what Christopher Benfi, along with my fellow panelists Karen and Gillian, consider a relational mode of knowing. The monstrosity of the well, with its abyss's face, can be seen as the intermission of home for bog plants like sedge. Whose survival is intimately linked to the aquatic system connected by wells, waterways, and rivers. The photo in the slide is taken from the Amherst College website, titled "The Daily Well," that used this image of the well to promote introspection and self-reflection as some kind of therapy for their students' mental health during the pandemic last year. Interestingly. Denny Wardrobe's reading of the Dickinson poem in her 1996 book *Emily Dickinson's Gothic* also emphasizes this quality of self-reflection through this act of looking at a well. Eco-Gothic serves as Dickinson's epistemological strategy to account for the limitation of human perceptions, while the speaker's perspective shifts. From a more ecophobic and anthropocentric view in the first three stanzas to a more ecologically aware, plant-centered view in the fourth stanza, the poem swiftly swerves from this analogous, speculative mode back to a more reflective, Aristotelian mode of thinking about the irony of this imposed way of knowing. Echoing Timothy Morton's notion of the strange stranger, manifesting how the epistemological impossibility could only be described and perhaps understood in Gothic terms. The ones they cite her most have never passed her haunted house nor simplified her ghost. I put the Morton quote from the ecological thought on the top of the slide. The haunted house of nature defies human interpretation and appropriation, despite or precisely because of its proximity. Those who know her know her less; the nearer her they get. For Dickinson, nature's strangeness often comes from its knowingness, free from human interference. The hypernormal, everyday quality of its opacity enhances its ecogothicism. And、apparently, with no surprise, arbitrary violence in nature is normalized by the frost, a blunt assassin. The frost behaving of any happy flower is not only treated indifferently by the passing sun, but it's permitted by an approving god. The sun's routine execution in the face of suffering with no interruption increases the surrealistic aberrationality in the poem. While conducting what Richard Brindley calls Dickinson's quarrel with God, the poem also enlists the unmoving sun as the implicit, acquiescent conspirator of God's apparent surpriseless design. Furthermore, having any happy flower as the object and recipient of two in the first two lines indicates how the flowers are also implicated in this accident, which turns out not so much of an accident. The ontological question of being at the end of the poem harkens back to the haunting epistemological implication at the very beginning of the poem. Apparently, with no surprise, demonstrates an ecological and for Dickinson, ecogothic foresight unknown to humans. The photo on the slide is a picture of a broken tulip infected by viruses, which paradoxically enhances its beauty. A fascinating botanical story I find relevant to the discussion here somehow. In an 1863 letter to T. W. Higginson, Dickinson wrote that 
I was thinking today as I noticed that the supernatural was only the natural disclosed. The court is shown on the slide. The photo on the slide is a picture of Puffer's Pond in Amherst. It was taken by the Massachusetts Daily Collegian in 2018 when a local person went missing, potentially drowned in the pond. With the quotation of the photo, I hope to show how Dickinson's natural supernaturalism, or even monstrosity, has been at the center of Dickinson's natural poems. It's often the authority the unknown world offers to anthropocentric modes of knowing that's most uncanny in Dickinson. Her poems repeatedly turn the complacency of the human observer inside out, making humans the actual stranger here. While some of the poems touch upon the ecophobic sentiments of her as well as our time towards a menacing, hostile, and potentially destructive force in the natural environment, mostly it's this productive recognition of the precarity, the ecographic wildness, as well as weirdness of the non-human human interaction that Dickinson props into most earnestly. By looking at the ecographic dimensions in Dickinson, I hope to deepen the current understanding of the rich legacies of Dickinson's ecological consciousness and its relevance to the increasingly unsettled human-non-human -human relations in the time of a globalized pandemic. If you have any further questions or comments, please don't hesitate to contact me at the email address on the slide. Thank you.